many of you are Netflix members? And how many are paying? I love you. <laughs> I'm a little obsessed, and I'd like to start with a little bit of research. So I want you to think for a moment, on a scale of zero to 10, where zero sucks and 10 is awesome, how likely are you to recommend Netflix to a friend or a colleague? So how many of you are a nine or a 10? And how many are a seven or an eight? And the zero to sixes? No, no, I love you, I love you. Okay, a little calculation, boom. That's a net promoter score in the 70s. That's dance on rooftop territory. I love Mr. Zero to Six. This is the person, the unsatisfiable, that drives me. And customer obsession, I got interested in this because I work with startups with a proof of concept that are ready to scale. And the challenge is keep everybody in the same direction. Mission does that, strategy does that. But the thing, if everybody in the organization is obsessed over how to delight the unsatisfiable, they move in the same direction, and it's a neat thing. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my early journey. I started at Electronic Arts in 1991, and I am older than dirt. And these are all the letters that I would read from these gamers, and it wasn't very helpful to me. And I was trained in customer focus and to be focused on the competition. I kept a picture of my competitor on my desk. And I worked to satisfy these gamers. And in the first success I had, this was literally an Oprah Winfrey mo moment. She threw Tickle Me Elmo's into the crowd and my first hit was Elmo's Preschool. And I learned to satisfy three, four, and five-year-olds and more importantly, their parents who paid. And then helped build a kid's software company with all these wonderful brands. You remember Madeline, the little French girl? Schoolhouse Rock. And then sold the company to Mr. Wonderful of Shark Tank. This is Kevin O'Leary. And then helped the learning company to grow. So proof that I'm older than dirt, I worked on Oregon Trails. <laughs> and we sold that company to Mattel for three and a half billion dollars. And a bad thing happened. This is how Kevin made his money. We all went off in different directions. And two years later, they spun that entity back and it was now worth one-tenth. Real reflection, how would I failed to build enduring and long-standing value? That was a failure. So in 2005, met this person. This is Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix. Netflix began, it got big on DVDs. Most of you know what those are. And he had two interview questions for me in, in Newsflash, I got the job. The first was, Gib, can you delight customers? I'm like, I freaking built Elmo's preschool and his kids had loved it. And the second, he asked me, can you do consumer science? And luckily I knew what he meant because I had asked him earlier what he wanted his legacy to be. And it wasn't to invent internet video, or to create a new industry of streaming. It was this one notion of consumer science. And the idea was, hey, said Reed, I'm kind of a geeky engineer. I'm not like Steve Jobs. I can't predict the future. I don't have a sense of fashion or style. But we'll create a system where we can test everything to see what works and what doesn't. And that was the consumer science. So I've got two journeys for you this morning. The first was a good world of customer focus, of working to satisfy customers, of listening carefully to them and competing. And then the journey into this fundamentally better world for me, which is about love. It's not about puppies, Eric. It's about customer obsession. This idea of delighting customers, of experimenting, inventing your way to this future that's so wonderfully hard to copy that you don't find yourself with many competitors. The other part of the journey, designers in the room, hang on. This is what Netflix looked like in 1999, and it sucked, right? And last night, when I did the screen capture, I hope you think it looks better. So there's really three chapters that I'm taking you through this morning. The first is something I call the DHM model. And the second, I'm gonna take you on a consumer science journey in one area, which is how Netflix personalization grew 
over time. And then I have a, a modern day, a today case for Netflix. They need your help. And the question is, people engage in a free trial. They hand over their credit card, and at the end of 30 days, should Netflix send a reminder letting folks know that their free trial is about to end? Text them, email, on their personalized homepage, let them know. So DHM, it's really quite simple. My job is quite simple. It is to delight customers in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. And margin enhancing is just a fancy way of saying make money. And I'm gonna share some of the balancing acts involved in this model. So if I take you back to 2005 and DVD, there was this balancing act of how much should you spend to delight. Now, if you remember, back then, a movie would come out in a theater, and two months later, you could get the DVD. And we would have 100,000 customers who wanted that DVD the next day in the mail, but we only had 50,000 discs because they were expensive. And we knew that six or eight or 10 weeks later, the demand would drop off. But if you talk to our customers, all the surveys, focus groups, the customer support data, it all said the same thing. People wanted their new release DVDs faster the next day in the mail. So we tested it. So now imagine there's about a million members and we create this test cell with 10,000 customers and those 10,000 customers get their new release DVD the next day in the mail. And the rest of us have to wait 5, 10, 15, 20 days. We were the control. How do we measure delight? It's all about cancel. So in the old days, 10% would cancel each month. And today, 2% cancel each month. One of those points is because there's no money in their bank account. And the other is it's summer, and maybe you shouldn't be binge watching. All right? So now I'm going to give you the A-B test results. And we were surprised by how little difference there was. The folks in control canceled at a rate of 4.5% per month. And the folks in this amazing experience, just a slight improvement in retention. If you do the math, if we rolled this out to all, we would save 5,000 customers. And for us, that was worth about a million bucks. And I'm going to give you the derivation. That's the 5,000 customers times the lifetime value, which is 100 bucks, times two. And that was because that person who loved the service would rave about it to a friend and bring someone into the system for free. We were doubling down on delight. Now you look at the cost of the additional inventory. It was $5 million to buy more expensive new releases. So we're going to gain $1 million and we're going to lose $5 million. Should we launch the all or not in our decision was we wouldn't that there wasn't enough value in that delight to warrant the cost. Now, there's a lot of companies today that might have done this. Amazon often argues that the word of mouth factor is actually 8x. And if you did the math, they might have launched this. But we were a punk startup, but we just didn't have the money, all right? So the hard to copy element. H.B. Mock, he created this wonderful new member page. And the job of this new member page is to get people to click on the Start Now button. And he did it. He improved through this insight, the happy family on the couch, improved conversion on this page. And I'm like, HB, you know, that's wonderful. But I'd love you to do stuff like this that's also hard to copy. Because I'm going to bet you my paycheck that within a month, those bastards at Blockbuster are going to have a freaking happy family on the couch, which is exactly what happened. The other part of this model is hard to copy. So think for a moment about what is hard to copy about Netflix today. If you had a punk startup, why would you choose not to go up against this company? And I'm going to reveal how I think about this. So it's a wonderful brand that you all trust your credit cards with. There is a huge network effect. Every television in the world is wired to let you stream Netflix. There's wonderfully unique technology like personalization that is wicked hard to copy. And I'm guessing that most of you were thinking about Netflix's original content 
as a hard to copy advantage. And that's true. And that comes because of this economy of scale. 130 million pay paying members lets them invest 500 million to do stranger things. Eight billion invested to launch a thousand movies and TV shows this year. Poor Amazon can only invest three billion and poor Hulu only two billion. This huge economy of scale. So the job in terms of product strategy is think of all the theories and hypotheses that will delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And these were all the theories that we pounded on in trying to do that. This, these were de facto product strategies. And I want you to think for a moment, what percentage of time did Netflix get it right? About half the time. And this is one of the secrets. It's high cadence failure in learning. And I want to point out a couple of surprising failures. Friends, if it's 2005 in Silicon Valley, everyone is asking, what's your social strategy? So the idea was that you'd get movie ideas from your friend. You'd be connected in this hard to copy network. You'd recommend titles that are cheaper. And there were two problems. It took us three years to figure this out. Your friends have sucky movie tastes, right? And the other thing is you don't really want your friends knowing everything that you're watching. So this is how we learned. Some other surprises, we tested exclusives in 2007. It failed. That was Red Envelope Studios. But by 2013, with this huge economy of scale, huge success in House of Cards. We opened up the APIs to let a 1,000 flowers bloomed. None bloomed, but the opening of those APIs in created this device ecosystem that's huge today. These are the strategies that worked. And for each of these strategies, we had a set of projects, a tactics, one against each on the left. And those changed over time as we pounded on these different strategies. And at any moment in time, we were measuring using proxy metrics whether or not we were making progress. The hard thing about retention, it's very hard to move. And so you have these proxy metrics against each of these theories to see if you are making progress. I want to go on to chapter two, take you on the consumer science journey with personalization. Consumer science is just a fancy way to refer to the experimental method. We have a hypothesis, we experiment, we have the results, and then we apply human judgment. We are still needed, as we did in the new release test. So this is what Dear Netflix looked like. It didn't look like this at all. This is about consumer insight, and that was the name of the game at Netflix, which is when I showed up, there were 50 different data points that described to me the, the, the business and customer behavior. This is existing data. We engaged in focus groups and qualitative and, and one-on-ones outside of Silicon Valley, because there are only freaks there. There are no normal people. We engaged in surveys. I gave you an example already, and of course the big dog was this A-B testing. And here's what Netflix looked like in 2005. There is nothing personalized about this. There is a tab. It's called recommendations. And I will tell you one thing in personalization. This is not a good word. Talk to folks as though they're human. You don't recommend that they go to coffee with someone. You, you don't recommend they go on a date. I don't think that's the word people use today, but I'm using it. You suggest that, that you might enjoy meeting this person. That's human language. Now, in personalization, of course, we crafted the strategies. First, we're going to get all the explicit data. You're going to rate tons of movies so we can understand your taste. And we're going to watch what you watch and not with streaming. That's the implicit data. And we're going to get to know you and all the data about movies, and we'll magically connect them with algorithms and different presentation layer tactics. And the fourth theory was over time, if we connected you with movies that had higher star ratings, you might retain better. And of course, we had projects against each of those strategies that we pounded on over time. And I'll share what they were. And the other idea, of course, is that we had proxy metrics that helped us to understand if each of those strategies was working. So now I'm going to take you on the journey. It is hard. And you guys already know the outcome. And I have a series of pop quizzes for you. And I'm guessing I'm going to twist your brain. This is hard. So pop quiz number one, 
this was one of our most important proxy metrics. And the simple question is, at the end of a new member's first six weeks with the service, what percentage of members rated at least 50 movies? Five zero. And our theory is if people gave us re ratings, it was because they valued the output. This was a signal that they appreciated the personalization. So I need you to think of a number. My one clue is it's between zero and 100. All those zero to five. All those five to 10. 10 to 20. 20 to 30. 30 or more. Ye of little faith. I'll tell you the answer in a moment, but I want you to look at the Movies You'll Heart tab. That designers use a very technical term to describe to me. They said, Gib, that's freaking fugly, which I think is a combination of funky and ugly. <laughs> so the answer is, we got close to 30%. And it's because of this thing that was invented People would click on that fugly little tab and they were introduced to something we called the ratings wizard. And they would go on ratings jags, rating tons of movies, and that's how we caught a ton of movie data. This is my family. Different age, gender, and the simple question I have is, will demographic data help predict people's movie taste? It is a yes, no question. How many people believe yes, it will help predict taste? And how many people believe no, it will not? The answer is no. People's movie tastes are wonderfully unique. Now, how did we know? Our metric for this is called root mean square error. And this is one of those metrics where down and to the right is good. You like Star Wars four star, uh, I'm sorry, we predict you like Star Wars four stars and Star Trek four stars, and you rate it and you give each four stars. We were perfect at understanding your movie tastes. And, and so this is one of the things that we're measuring that on, on mass. And it turns out when we added the age and gender data to the algorithms, it did not improve RMSE at all. We were quite surprised. The big dog was collaborative filtering. I'm sorry. Um, and, and this is something called the Quackle, which is the QAD confirmation layer. You would add a title to your Q. In this case, you've added Icon. And it would suggest other titles Maybe you'll like mostly Martha. And this was done via a collaborative filtering algorithm. You like Star Trek and Star Wars. You like Star Trek and Star Wars. You liked Hotel Rwanda, so you will like Hotel Rwanda. And that's how collaborative filtering works en masse. And it leads to strange things. Because you like Breaking Bad, we think you'll like Sesame Street. Because this is what the math says. There's no context. But 20% of the Q ads came from this one page. We had a problem. We had only one engineer working on collaborative filtering. His name was Stan Lanning. We needed more help. So we outsourced it. Does anyone remember the Netflix prize? So we said we'll give a million bucks to anybody who can improve RMSE by 10%. And we got some insights pretty quickly. And you can actually get a clue of what they are. Look at the team names here. We have one team that's called Opera Solutions and Vandalay United. You know, clearly Seinfeld fans. But what was going on was teams knew they had to win, and if they weren't the winner, if they were in second and third, they reached out and they combined all the algorithms from different teams, and it turned out more algorithms was better. Unbelievable. The other insight that they got was that the ratings that, that, that you got from the ratings wizard were not nearly as valuable as the titles that you related as a member in the service over time. <sighs> We've got a shiny new algorithm. 10% better at guessing your movie tastes. Will that improve retention? How many people believe it will actually improve retention, this new algorithm? And how many believe the opposite? 
and some of you have lost your arms. <laughs> so we did this. It did not improve retention. And, and designers in the house, it was usually a combination of algorithm and presentation layer te techniques that led to improvement. Now, there was some good news in this. This was the single best recruiting device for engineers at Netflix. Before the Netflix prize, there was no engineer that thought Netflix was cool. And after, they believed it was true. It was cool. More algorithms is better. Our friends at Pandora are doing music. And they had something called the Music Genome Project. They had 50 musicologists tagging music. Jack Johnson, folks, folk acoustic, guitar, surfing stuff. These were all tagged and appropriate for 56-year-old people. It's true. And we did the same. We had 50 people down in LA. These are movie colleges. A cool job. Watch a lot of movies and then tag them. And this algorithm, which we added to the mix, improved most of our proxy metrics. So in this case, because, Gib, you liked Airplane, we think that you'll like Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club in this category of cult, cult comedies from the 1980s. And this was a big driver at helping you connect with movies that you love. And it was this win of algorithm plus presentation layer tactic. Meanwhile, Crystal Chancuti, her job is to make it wicked easy for you to find DVDs to add to your quay, because that's how Americans said that word. And she drove it up until the right. And then you see, around 2009, her metrics started to drop. What was going on? Streaming. And there's Brent Airy. His, his metric is percentage of members who watch at least 15 minutes in a month, he's driving it way up and to the right. 15 minutes was the smallest unit of value. It was the shortest TV episode. And it's game time, because now Netflix can become a streaming company, and it can go worldwide. Because you no longer have to create those DVD by mail systems and work with the US Postal Service, et cetera. Which brings me to pop quiz number four. I hope this is in French. I will not read it to you. But the question is, is it helpful to know that someone is French and they live in France? Should you inform the algorithms with that knowledge? Now, you all have arms. Get ready. You're either a yes or a no person. So all those who believe yes, hands in air. And all those who believe no, hands in air. And the no's have it. This did not, that the idea is, Movie taste is wonderfully unique. It's more helpful to know five or six titles that a person likes than it is to, to know this data. Fascinating. International company, this little company called Facebook had created a new system for rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Netflix had created billions of ratings with this five-star system. Netflix said, let's test it. They got twice as much taste input with the simple gesture of thumbs up and thumbs down. And what about the poor stars? What happens to the poor stars? Well, remember my fourth theory, that over time, if average movie rating of the titles that you watch improves, which it did, it should improve retention. Except there was no data to support this theory, this hypothesis. And let me tell you what was going on. This was a mystery. We had to go out and talk to customers, create alternate theories for what the heck was going on. And we talked to them and we asked, hey, tell me a favorite movie. And they'd say something like Hotel Rwanda that makes them look smart. They say, I love documentaries. <laughs> but if we dug deeper, there was something going on that there's an idea of movie enjoyment that has nothing to do with star rating. Because believe it or not, there's lots of people who are watching Paul Blart's Mall Cop, a huge category of leave your brains at the door comedy. In fact, Paul Blart, this was so freaking good that you had to do Mall Cop 2. 
So the theory is blown. It's all about movie enjoyment. Stars really don't matter. So if you look carefully at the Netflix experience today, the stars are gone. In this case, Netflix is suggesting that Casino is a 98% match for me. No statement of the quality of the movie. The stars are gone. It's so sad, really. This is what my site experience looks like today. Everything is instant. Click the button and I'm going. Lots of original content because of that economy of scale. It's wonderfully simple and it's personalized for every member of my family on any device across the world. It's a big deal. What I really love about personalization, in the beginning, it was helping you sift through 100,000 DVDs to find a few that you like. And then over time, what's really going on today is Netflix is trying to predict when a new title comes to them, how many of you will watch it. And so the idea, how many have watched Stranger Things? The idea was 100 million people would watch Stranger Things and they could afford to spend 500 million on that. They're right sizing the investment based on all of this personal data of your movie tastes. How many of you enjoy BoJack Horseman? Okay, thank you for being with me. And there's two million people who watch and they just had to right size it. They spent 10 million on this. And this is the way cool thing. This is why two weeks ago, they, they were able to get 23 Emmys up against HBO who had 23 Emmys. And I know who's going to win next year. It's really quite exciting. Personalization is all about delighting these customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways. My third chapter, Netflix needs your help. Customer service says, hey, we're spending about 10 million bucks from people calling in on day 31, 32, 33 saying, I meant to cancel, but I forgot. And one of the customer service reps says, hey, what if we send a very aggressive reminder? Now I have to ground you with some pieces of data. The thing to ask yourself is when someone sees this page, what percent go on to enter their credit card and engage in the free trial. Uh, my workshop Monday people, what's the answer? Two, I need you to yell it louder. Two percent, damn it. <laughs> and the second question, it's, it's really surprisingly small. The second question is month one retention. What percent go on to engage in the paid service? And this number is surprisingly high. What number is it? 90, 90. they're so freaking smart in four hours. This is important data. Netflix tested it. All these messages, your free trial is about to end. And what happens to month one retention? Do these customers notice? They do, and it drops to 85%. And you're the product manager for this, and I'll tell you the margin story. You just lost 60 million bucks. But we're going to back out the 10 million because we don't have those phone calls. So you've just lost 50 million bucks. And the question is, should they launch the test to all or not? So I want you to think just for a minute about the model of delighting customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. We know margin, lose 50 million. But what about delight? How do people feel about getting this reminder? You know, might they tell their friend that Netflix is kind of cool? How would you feel about knowing that a, cust a, a, a company might choose to do this? Would you feel a little bit better about Netflix? Would you feel much better than you did about AOL 20 years ago when they made it impossible to cancel, for instance? What's the hard to copy thing here? What is it? What is it? Goodwill, and goodwill is all about trust, and trust is all about what? Uh, it's about the brand. So there is the potential for delight and to build an even stronger brand that people know and love. Now, who makes this decision at Netflix? You've got a very unhappy CFO. 
You CEO love to be engaged in this, and this is the decision of Tom Willerer. He's the product manager. And there's a, there's a big debate, and what are you smoking, Tom, et cetera. And at the end of the day, Tom decided to launch the test to all. And I'll give you the learnings from this case. This was one of those examples where Tom decided to double down on delight. The idea is over time, the brand will continue to grow. More happy customers will come into the fold. And there, there's this hard to copy advantage of the brand. And yes, doing the right thing and building a great brand has a cost. It is exactly $50 million in this case. And the insight that Tom had was this was actually for him a rather low stakes decision. It was 50 million against 8 billion in revenue. Not that big a deal. And the other insight that he had was it was totally reversible. If he was wrong, he could flip the switch back. And most of us get takes too, too much time, and he made this quickly because he understood it was a low stakes. And then I've revealed a little bit about the Netflix culture. The fervent debate. And then Tom decided, and all those people magically aligned behind him. They were on board. It's a very mature organization. All right, so there's three more things to, to succeed. <sighs> the first is courage. It took 30 minutes for Netflix to make the decision to invest $100 million in House of Cards and one day to make the decision to cut Kevin Spacey because of the sexual harassment with teenage boys. That's courage. It also requires patience. It only takes 20 years to build a great company. And I want you to notice that little moment right before 2012 where Kelsey was going to med school. Kelsey's not going to med school. The company was worth 40 billion, and then shortly after was only worth 10 billion. And this was the moment in time that Netflix announced Quickster, that the DVD service would be separated from the streaming. And this is the third attribute, humility, okay? Everyone ate up this incredibly boneheaded decision called Quickster. And if you ask Reed what happened, he said, I, 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 I got arrogant. I forgot to obsess over the customers. I didn't realize what a stinky experience that I was putting these customers through. So stay humble. So when I'm working with different companies, I know they're obsessed when they have the existing data. I know they're obsessed when they have the voice of the customer through these qualitative. I know they're obsessed when they can show me their survey data, and I love them when they can test the balancing act of delight and margin using A-B testing. And I love it when they have a theory and hypotheses about how they will delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. So for me, customer obsession is about love. It's about putting the customer at the center of everything you do to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways to invent a better future for you. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Now, did I mention I'm obsessed? I'm at that very awkward moment. You see street performers, they do their thing, they pass the hat, and everybody leaves. And I'm not going to pass the hat. But I have a simple ask of you. I would love, love, love it if the Android people in the room would go to www.gibsonbiddle.com. At the very top, there is a Net Promoter Survey link. And you can get these other things as well. And this next thing is a very exciting moment for me. For the iPhone users, I am wondering if this is the first time in the history of the Earth that a QR code will be helpful. <laughs> so hold up your phone. I am hoping that a link will magically appear that will take you to this Net Promoter Score survey. Oh my god, it worked. <laughs> uh, so you get a taste of the obsession. So if you have questions today, I will be at the talk stop session. I'm really looking forward to that. And if you didn't get the memo, I'd love, love, love it if you gave me a little bit of feedback. And with that, I truly say thank you. Mm -hmm.